Shalom, everyone. That's what happened with technological bugs. But remember, last week we were with uh, um, survival expert guy, and he said, whenever you have a problem, just stop, breathe, drink a glass of wine or coffee, and restart, reboot. And that's what we're going to try and do today. We cooked with Tali the other day, uh, the secrets of tahini. And tonight, we're going to reveal who is G. We're going to talk about the Mossad. And if I had to ask you, name the top five intelligence organizations in the world, probably the Mossad would be one of them, right? MI6, CIA, and then the Mossad. How did the Mossad start? What are the events that made the Mossad such an amazing brand? And the Mossad is Israel Intelligence Agency and started in 1948 with the partition map, partition map in the UN when Israel was departed into an Arab state and a Jewish state, surrounded by five countries and 28 Arab countries altogether. Israel understood that military is not enough. We need to know and gather information. And they started with Mr. Avim. Literally, Mr. Avim means to be an Arab. Uh, you all know it, uh, probably watched season three of Fauda and Netflix, and you saw how, you, how the people emerge, not only the Sephardic Jews that came from North Africa, even the Ashkenaz, with the right disguise, you, uh, you emerge. And, and besides gathering information, the Mossad uh, needs to do important roles in defending Israel. Gather information, again, we're going to Netflix, we remember Eddie Cohen and the spy, and uh, uh, we uh, gathered last year the Iranian files of the nuclear, and that helped Israel show and perpetrated uh, Iran in a color that they did not want to be. And then we are the defender of the uh, Jewish state, Israel, such a tiny state, but we've got as much Jews outside Israel and the Mossad took that duty of being that the defender. We need to bring to justice those that have harmed Jewish people. And you know, all along, uh, Jewish were targets. We know the Munich uh, Olympics. Uh, we know uh, other incidents. And probably most remembers it is Adolf Eichmann. Uh, there's a good book, the, uh, the House on 14 Garibaldi Street, that shows how the Mossad uh, operation brought him and then disguised him as uh, an attendant and brought him is to Israel for justice. And we need to neutralize military threats. We know the bombing of the Iraqi um, reactor in 81, the uh, Syrian reactor that was built by North Korea uh, was uh, uh, bombed by Israeli uh, Air Force in 2007 retaliate against uh, the perpetrators of terror. So we don't hear a lot because the Mossad works secretly. We only hear probably what the Mossad wants, what they want us to hear, or when there are problems. We heard that in Mabkhuch, in, in Dubai, and uh, we know Imad Mornia was uh, one of the founders of Hezbollah, and was uh, in charge of, of, of killing a lot of people, the Marines in Beirut and the embassy, and Israel took him and blew up his car. And the last and not least is not to defend against people that arm Israel, but actually bring Jews, re Jewish refugees um, to come to Israel. And we talk about in the early 80s, we talk about the Ethiopians that came throughout uh, the uh, deserts of Sudan and uh, were brought by the Mossad agents. Uh, we know, again, Netflix, there's the Red Sea Diving Resort. It's a good movie and shows us how the Mossad did it. They built like a club med, like a diving resort. During the day, they had guests, and during the night, they would bring them uh, to trucks and then to boats, and later on, air codices came. And, uh, so watch it. It's really nice. So from the macro to the micro, um, we're going to talk about who is the Mossad? What do you need in order to be a typecast? And guys, you can ask any question you want. Some of them will be answered by G, some of them won't. Uh, and please, you have to understand. And, and I welcome G with us. And tonight, we can reveal 
uh, his real name. Hmm. <laughs> Erev Tov, good evening. Glenn. Good evening, sunshine. <laughs> Alan, Alan, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. It's uh, it's great to be here and great to see you again. Aviv, the man, uh, one of the most creative guys I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, during the promotion of this evening that we do once a week on a Sunday at 9 p.m. Israel time and 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, a lot of questions, uh, people are sending a lot of questions during uh, WhatsApp, and one of the questions that they had was how do you become a spy in the Israeli Mossad? Yeah, well, <laughs> first of all, um, you have to realize that um, statistically, um, about one out of a thousand people who apply are actually accepted. Um, so it's uh, the statistics are are against you, but um you gotta you know when we talk about becoming a spy um that's uh you know it's it's a broad word and people have different connotations and i want to maybe just give it a little bit of a context because you know a, a, an intelligence agency like the mossad um operates abroad and uh basically everyone has to work undercover okay and the whole idea is not to you know not to be connected to to israel and to be doing uh, missions abroad uh, undercover uh, so but it's important to realize that there, there are also different different levels of, of cover okay and um you know it, it really makes a big difference you have one uh, extreme could be to go all the way to be living deep deep undercover maybe even in an enemy enemy country um undercover with a, not just a different name, uh, but with a different uh, religion, of course, you're not connected to, to Judaism or to Israel, a different nationality, um, and it's all made up, and 24-7 you're living a lie undercover. Uh, that is one extreme which is really all the way out there, and that, for example, that's something uh, most people have seen the Netflix uh, series, uh, The Spy, uh, Eli Cohen, who lived like that in, in Syria, uh, and he would come back uh, once every six months. He would uh, he would come home to to connect to his uh, his family, and um, you know they didn't even know that he was uh, what he was doing. His, he he had to lie to his to his wife. Um, so that's really um, one uh, extreme. There are not many people who uh, operated or operate like that, uh, even though. You know there are a few, and I and I have intimate uh, acquaintance and knowledge of that working like that. But you have to realize that most of the people uh, are out there. You know they could be doing, they could be undercover for maybe even just for for five minutes while they're you know passing uh, uh, to get into some uh, some place and to, to to break into to some um, installation. Uh, they'll uh, pretend to to be uh, undercover. They'll speak a uh, foreign language, but in, in their uh, in their sock, they'll be carrying uh, an Israeli passport uh, somewhere in uh, in Europe. And uh, so that's that's a different type of uh, of level of cover and 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 pressure that's on a person because uh, he knows, okay, worst comes to worst, I can, you know, uh, if I get in trouble with the uh, the local authorities, let's say in Europe, then I'll. I can get out of it, and the Israeli uh, government will help me out of it. But if, like I said, if you're all the way on the end, like Eli Cohen, um, that's it. You're on your own, and nobody's uh, nobody can really help you. Um, of course, everyone knows the, the sad story of uh, how it ended with uh, with Eli Cohen and his uh, hanging. But uh, uh, there, there are other guys who, who are out there, and uh, to this day, working deep undercover, and we have no idea that they're out there. But just imagine what it means. They go so deep undercover that they, they forget what their what their original name was uh, was like, what their real name is. They're so deep uh, undercover, and, and that psychologically, you can imagine what what it means. So so basically, you need to have if we think about the uh, the qualities that you need. You have, psychologically, you have to be so 
strong and so um, uh, have such a, a strong sense of self that you don't get confused. And I, I, I took it like, like sort of like, a, like an anchor. So it's sort of hard to see my, my full arm here, but like an anchor like this, where me, my solid self, that's me, but I can, I can move all, all the way to the other ends and become somebody else without forgetting who I really am. Because that, we've had stories like that of people who've actually gotten confused and they, they got too deeply into, their, uh, into the figure that they're undercover. They would come back to Israel and they'd still be like walking around, uh, they come to Israel and, and let's say they're pretending to be this uh, VIP uh, businessman, you know, multimillionaire. Uh, they'd come back to Israel and they'd walk around in the in the office with a three-piece suit. You know, in Israel, yeah, people <laughs> wear like jeans and a and a and a shirt. In the even in the Israeli, uh, um, even here in, in in the in the Mossad in the in the offices. And they get, get a guy comes back wearing a three-piece suit, uh, thinking that he's still uh, this uh, this millionaire. But it's like a guy, you know, <laughs> get a life. You forget who you are. So that that's one of the dangers. So you have to have a solid sense of self. Uh, to be able to do something like that, because you really stretch way out of your of yourself and your and your real identity. So, Glenn, when you become a field operation, how how long does it take? Is it months? Is it years? Uh, is it over? I mean, when is it over that you learn, or is it never? Yeah. Well, so I'm, let me let me. Uh, take you into the world uh, how, how, how the training is done. Um, basically, you can take Ellie Cohen for, for an example. He was, he was trained uh, for eight months uh, on his own in an apartment on his own. Okay, so, so just imagine what this means. As far as the, the compartmentalization uh, is so strict that he was trained on his own. Okay, and so that's something that um, you have to also be able to deal with being on your own. So you, you put into to, to an apartment with a one-on-one -on -one instructor. Um, I've, I've spoken to his, his instructor who, uh, who taught him the, the ropes. He's no longer with us, but uh, I, I heard his uh, descriptions of what, uh, what went on there. And, um, and some things have changed over the years, but at the end of the day, it's, it's pretty much uh, the same. And so, um, could be between eight and 12 months of, of training, uh, very intense, and you're basically cut off and, and you get used to um, that, that type of attitude of, of pretending to, to be undercover. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll, I want to demonstrate something that's, uh, that, that we do in, in the training. Okay, I'm going to ask the, the viewers also to, to play along with us here, not just to, put, to be part of this. I'm going to give you a little exercise, a 30 second exercise. Are you up for? To do this, Aviv, 30 seconds, yeah? Okay, so what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is to, is to you're gonna have to, to, to jump on one, uh, one foot for 30 seconds, okay? But one the idea is, right? I you, you uh, okay. I want you to first think uh, in your mind, how many times can I uh, jump on one foot in 30, 30 seconds. seconds, okay? Uh, think of that number and keep it in your mind and then we're gonna we're gonna do the uh, the exercise, and we'll see uh, how many you actually did uh, jump compared to what you thought. Okay, so are we ready to are we ready to start? Yes, the second. I'm also gonna get uh, you. It means you got to get up also and show uh, show the guys that right, right, right. role model. Okay, we all need to do this. All right, me too. All right, ready? One, two, three, go. Oh yeah, a good exercise, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, couple more seconds, then. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, so first of all, V, can you tell us what you uh, what you thought and uh, what you did to compare? Yeah, I thought I would do fifty-seven times. And how I, did you do? I did eighty. <laughs> all right, so that's already at least fifty percent more than you. Actually, so we have. Uh, is it possible to hear uh, from 
from people the uh, numbers? Do we get that? Uh... Yeah. Guys, you can write, uh, you can share with us in the comments. How, you know, two numbers. The first number is what you thought you would jump on one leg in 30 seconds, and the other one, <clears throat> what you literally did. <laughs> Okay, and the, the idea behind this exercise, uh, that, that's basically, if I have to sum up in, in, in a nutshell, what, uh, what is done, how the Mossad uh, trains its, its guys. You basically take somebody from the street, it could be anybody out there uh, that's watching now, and, and you actually take him and you, and you cause him to have a transformation of his mindset of what he thinks he is capable, okay? And the idea is that uh, people come in thinking that they're capable of X, and by the time they finish the training, they understand and they know that they are capable of at least 10 times X. Okay, and in something small like this, do we have any numbers out there that people? Uh... Yeah, we have, uh, we have Nadav, <laughs> what, Nadav? <laughs> well, you, ain't, you, ain't, you ain't coming uh, to, <laughs> to our training. <laughs> Yeah, Dov is a great man. I don't know what, but uh, yeah. And we have uh, Jessica did much more than I thought. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, she did what she thought 30 and did. Wow. That's go, more than 100% more than, we, than she initially thought. Yeah. That's good That's for you. What do we have, Brian? Shalom, Brian. Also, so, twice as much. Wow. Yeah. So 30, 60, 90. Brian, you look fantastic. <laughs> So basically, those are 90% of the people. That's, that's what actually happens. We, we all uh, think that we're capable of X, but we're all capable of much, much more than we imagine. And so the idea is we take uh, people. We don't just tell them that. We don't just do an exercise like this. We'll do it in the field from day one. I'll give you an example of, uh, of, of an exercise that, that we'll do. And on, on the first day of training, you'll take somebody and uh, walk down the streets of, uh, of Tel Aviv. And, uh, and then the instructor will say uh, to the guy, okay, you see that? Uh, that uh, balcony up there on the, on the second floor, um, and uh, this happened uh, to me. And I said, um, "I said, yeah, okay." And I said, uh, "Okay, I want you in 90 seconds. I want you to be up there on the balcony, waving to me from there." I looked at uh, the guy at my instructor. Said, "What? You, you must be crazy. That's that's impossible. There's no way in the world I can ever do something like that." And I said, "Are you this? You're not serious, right?" And he says, "87, 86, 85." <laughs> <laughs> this guy's serious. I ran across the street, up uh, two flights of stairs, and sure enough, 82 seconds later, I was out there on the balcony with a smile from ear to ear, waving uh, to my instructor. So, um, so that's just a small example. That's that's just the first thing. Like, oh my god, I can't believe I just did that. You know, I, I convinced somebody to let me into their house. And not just into their house, but all the way out to cross the entire house and to go out onto the balcony. And you know, who would, who would imagine that? Okay, and, and this is and, I, and, I, and we just started the first day, all right. And so I'm already feeling, oh my god, I'm capable of you know, X times four. So you just do more and more things like that over and over again, and you practice being being undercover. You go around uh, doing missions, pretending to be somebody else, and and you see people actually buy the story. And you actually, you know, not only do they buy it that you're somebody else, but they actually, they, they really want to help you. And, uh, and and you realize, wow, I have so much more ability and I'm actually able to, to convince people to do things and, and, and to do things that I, I never imagined possible. And so th that's how you end up reaching the end of the course um, with, the, with the mindset. And this is the mindset of a, of a Mossad uh, agent, that uh, there is no such thing as mission impossible, and that's that's the bottom line. In one sentence, if I'd have to sum up, you know, what what okay, we do today, it's amazing. no such thing as, as mission mission impossible. Okay, you just you you know, and it's people from yeah, you know, and that's the thing. It's not just people in, in the Mossad. The people who are in the Mossad, they're 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 fle flesh and blood. They're they're not supermen. They they came in also doubting themselves, but uh, but we uh, have the the method to actually train them and turn them into uh, into believing that uh, that anything is possible, and it, and of course it helps when you know that the mission has you know it's a mission to to help protect uh, the country or Jews uh, around the world, so that gives you even more uh, motivation to actually do something. But what we apply these things also not just in in the Mossad, but any. Uh, I, my, I claim that anybody can 
can do these things. And that's that's part of um, I'm writing a book now, and that's what it's uh, it's about to see to bring that to the secrets of the of the Mossad uh, to uh, to everybody. Uh, it could be a corporate, it could be you know your personal lives. But we're all capable of much more than yeah. we even imagine. We're gonna we're gonna write in the end uh, a few books about the Mossad. A uh, few that in the last decade, a few recent ones. Uh, Ronan Bergman had a good one. Uh, there's others. And I'll ask you now, I'll challenge you, you know, that um, doing those things. Um, I'll ask you a question. That's for you, Glenn. Yeah. Well, really, the first, uh, the, the first thing is, is, is the mindset. Uh, I'm telling you, I even look back now. I mean, I've been uh, retired for for five years, um, and um, when I when I when I sometimes I find myself like uh, doubting myself and um, you know and and wondering, hmm, you know, is uh, can I can I really pull this off or you know? And then I say, you know what, man, I just I just look back and I, and I, and I remember and I just tap into that to that mindset which uh, which means that anything uh, anything is possible and uh, and I'll remember that I'll remember the things that I did and uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll realize yeah okay that's I, I can do this and that's that's the biggest gift that's the biggest thing that, that we get from there um, I'll, I'll give you some some examples also from things that we how we train our guys not just in the Mossad, but also in like the the top uh, Israeli army uh, elite uh, commando units, and um, the guys who have to go out and, and be you know to do missions in enemy territory, we train them for uh, for for POW uh, training to 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 get them ready for worst case scenario if they do fall in uh, enemy uh, hands in enemy territory, how to how to actually survive that. Okay, and, and these are things that we, we, we train them, and the things that I feel like I also I went through there because I was I was also a pilot in the, in the Israeli Air Force, and you know I did my first uh, POW training uh, there, and afterwards, you know, I trained them myself, um, and I and I and I also remember like uh, to go back and you know I think of those the terrible moments when you're you know, you're being treated like a like a POW, and you're being treated like um, you know you you everything has been taken from you. Um, but I but I, I think things from a, a POW situation, if you survive that kind of training, then it means you're you're ready for anything uh, in life. And so that's that's something that we take away. If you you know if you go through such such hard hardship and you and you manage to to endure it, uh, then that's something that. It, it's a it's a skill that you can take with you anyway. I think, and, and we can connect it to even even now, you know, during uh, COVID nineteen or any any time where there's some real real hardship you're going through, and it seems like okay, this is the end of the world. It's like you know, it's 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 the worst situation, a real crisis. Um, but if you have the ability to what we call, you know, there's a lot of things that we teach our, our guys in the training to be able to 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 reframe the situation. And to, to see it, uh, you know, and not not as uh, as a terrible tragedy or a crisis, but to see it as as an opportunity, an opportunity for growth. You, and and this is also a, you know, I deal with all our top uh, commanders, and uh, you know, which is they, they they operate the guys the the, the what, what separates the, the the good commanders in in the in the IDF elite units and and the Mossad from the from the mediocre ones. Is there is their ability uh, to see a situation and uh, to be to be optimistic about it and to see the the opportunity of the, and not to see it as, as 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 a hardship? They won't. They'll even use the, the jargon and, and you know it's, I I suggest you guys also out there listening to to practice your words and not even you know when a situation is like that and not to say oh this you know this is tough but to say oh this is this is an opportunity. And just just in a second, you just, you flip the situation around. And it gives you a sense of control. And even in the in the POW training, we, we tell the guys what, what, I, what I teach them is it's called the paradox of control. Okay, that's something also it's it's relevant for you know for for a situation like this and COVID nineteen where it seems as if we have no control. There's no, there's complete uncertainty. The 
the entire world, all of us, we, 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 we have no control, supposedly, but what we teach in the paradox of control, also as a POW and also in any situation like this, is that we actually uh, have uh, control of the most important thing, and that's two things. One is our mind, and the other is our, our emotions. What we think in our mind, for a POW, we tell them, you know, you literally think of, you know, the, the words that, you know, that in, your, in your mind, the information that you have in your mind that the enemy is trying to get out of you, you control that. Okay, that's the thing that, that's most interesting to the, to the interrogator. He wants to know what you have in your head. So you control that. And the second thing is, not just in, in your mind, you also control your mindset, how you perceive the situation. And if you're going to uh, allow uh, the situation to get the better of you, or if you're going to see it uh, in a positive way, and, and your emotions, and how, how are you, you going to feel about it? And so we got guys that are like crawling on the floor in POW training, uh, you know, being tortured and you know, licking the the, the, the floor and um, and um, you know, for example, uh, one guy, you know, they, they they told us, okay, now you have to you have to yell Allah Wakbar to, to say in Arabic, uh, God is great. So some of us said, you know, let's say instead of Allah Wakbar, we'll say Allahu Akbar, which means uh, uh, Allah is, is a mouse. Uh, just like it's our little way of like getting a uh, way of controlling situation, like the, these little victories and just little things like that, where even in the worst uh, case scenario, you can maintain a sense. Uh, where, is your focus, where is your focus point when you, when, when it's so hard? What are you thinking about this? Do they teach you or are you taught to go to this place, you know? Um, I mean, I'll give yeah. you an example. When I have problems, I go to this moment when the, when I'm in the Maldives, I'm 20 meters down, I'm on my knees, and I want a friend of me, a friend of mine, to take a picture of me, and suddenly there's a group of maybe 400 uh, yellow fish, big yellow fish that circle me. And yeah. I see it, and I get calm. And I think it took years, but it was only 30 seconds. And right. that's, that's the point of calm. Yeah. Well, we teach our guys actually um, to really be able to do, um, to find a way, it's like a fine balance between disconnecting um, from a situation that's hard, but also still uh, having a sense of like a, a center and, and, and connected to, to yourself. So we, we teach guys how to, how to do like, um, uh, use your imagination and to like float, uh, float away somewhere um and uh, to do um connect the mind and the body yeah you can uh we, we teach guys also to to be to be in touch it depends on what situation you're in though like if you're if you're being you know beaten and you're being you know physically uh you know in, in a lot of pain then um then it helps to just disconnect and sometimes even use a use a mantra i i remember maybe some people out there have, have seen a, a book the a famous bestseller called dune that was uh, written by uh, um, Herbert, I uh, forget the name, Frank Herbert, maybe, but uh, it was a trilogy uh, called uh, Dune. And uh, I'll never forget the guy there, he had, a, he had a mantra. I read it, I don't know, maybe 40 years ago, I'll never forget. He said, pain does not exist. I will let the pain go over and through me. And he just had this mantra that he said over and over again. And so, so mantra is really... Uh, really help in situations like that, and you just you know you just convince yourself, okay, it just doesn't exist. I'm not gonna, I'm not connected to it, and then you just disconnect. And and for for me, um, what I do is I also I, I remember like when I go off on uh, I'm, I'm an ultra marathoner and uh, Ironman um, competitor, so when I go out, and, you know, I I remind myself when I was out on like a long run, you know running 60, 80 kilometers, you just end up, uh, you just disconnect I and mean, you're floating. And, and it turns out that you just, you lose a sense of time and space and, and just uh, disconnect. It, it is possible to, to reach uh, situations yeah. like that. So we have a question from Jessica and uh, Je I mean, Glenn, we know the answer to this one, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, so that's the thing. I mean, my whole point, uh, and also the whole point of me you know, coming out and talking, uh, you know, about what you know what's done in the Mossad is not to uh, for people's uh, curiosity. Even though it's very, people are curious and they want to hear you know, stories. But the the what I am so sure of, and I know, is that 
all these things we can apply uh, in, uh, you know, in in corporate uh, organizations and, and and also for people even for, for families uh, for that matter and so uh, we do uh, have workshops and uh, we've uh, developed uh, you know, together with uh, with Israel Unlimited uh, we have uh, you know we take the really the same things that we do in the in the Mossad uh, training and we apply it for uh, people uh, who can come and, 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 and try these things on their own, either to, um, depending on the size of the group um, and their goals, but we can uh, adapt it to uh, either, you know, either a family coming and looking to have a, a wow experience in Israel or uh, an organization, you know, a corporate who want to do uh, team uh, building or, or management uh, leadership training. And uh, the, the, the idea, it's the generic idea is the same between them. The idea is to push the envelope. Okay, we take people you know, out of their out of their comfort zone. You know, they've got that this comfort zone and we and we expand that comfort zone. We push them out of there and we do things in a you know in the streets of Tel Aviv uh, where people, you know, we give them missions to go out and, and, and do outrageous things that uh, you know just like you know for example I said about that. Right. And we were right? surprised by some of the, the the things that they did, you know. So, uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. Do you remember that we, we deal a lot with YPO? And do you remember that home retreat uh, that entered the hotel? And I'm not going to say more because maybe some of, of the people that will watch us uh, will do that. But we were surprised, right? Completely, like, yeah. There was, there was a group of eight, uh, eight guys from YPO from you know, the other side of the world. And uh, and they came here and they split up into, into teams of... Uh, of, of three and uh, yeah, and they they managed to you know, to, to follow uh, the bad guys around uh, the, the streets and then and, and, and enter into a hotel and convince them to do things to let them into places and to take uh, photographs and to uh, and to rig up uh, with, with special uh, equipment and you know they, they became really spies for for, for the day and uh, and did things that they 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 they, they didn't imagine was, was was even possible for them. And, and these are, you know, that's an example of, 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 of the guys and the, the teamwork that they, they have be, between them to actually coordinate everything and to, to split up the missions uh, between them and to debrief and to learn the, the lessons. It was, uh, it was like a, in, in one day that it was worth like a corporate training of, of a week. And that's an example of, of, of YPOs. Uh, but you've also got, you know, the, the families who, uh, you know, they they ended up uh, discovering uh, things of their, their kids. Um, I, you know, there was a, a teenage kid. Uh, do you remember? They they almost. Uh, you know, he was he was. He was yeah, a, no yeah. Names. yeah, yeah, right. right. But you, you remember how you know he was uh, he was he was against everything that that that, that you know the, the parents wanted to do, and then finally, what happened was that he he took control of this uh, of this mission. And he led them through it. He navigated uh, with, you know, with a map through the streets of old uh, Jaffa, and he told them what to do. And he managed to uh, to do things that he, he didn't imagine. And then, and, and, and he saved the day. They made a mistake, and he told them, "No, you're following the wrong person." And they, and he convinced them. And and it turns out, two months later, I got this uh, the, the WhatsApp from the father saying, "I want just want you to know, you know, the, my son." The other day, he did something that he would never ever have done. And he took uh, initiative and, and and did something uh, in his life that made a big difference. And it's clear to me, he said, that it was uh, a direct uh, uh, result of that workshop that uh, that he did in, in in Jaffa, where where he managed to believe in himself that he was capable of doing much more than he imagined. So it works for for everybody. I mean, guys, whoever you're watching from everywhere. So one of one of my values when I founded Israel Unlimited was to take people and take them to a journey. It, it's not a tour, it's not a try, it's a journey. They come here as people that know Israel, yes, no, Jewish, and they go for a journey. And through this journey, they meet people like Glenn and meet people like Guy and meet people like, uh, you know, any chef or whatever. And what we try to do is we try not to just listen to Glenn, uh, but actually to work with him because that's the real experience. When you do something like that, I'm telling you, I probably he won't forget uh, that, but he, he will probably not remember how many people were on top of Masada, but he will never forget this.
And, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and Glenn is doing a great job. And, you know, at first when we met, um, you, know, you know just a bit about Glenn. Glenn, maybe about every part of your life, we could have, we can have an interview, we can have a seminar, right? <laughs> yeah, there are a few chapters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that's amazing. And, and YPO, um, as a fact, it's exactly the people that uh, want to be taken out of the comfort zone and, and, and give them in one day or more uh, what they can uh, try and learn in years. Yeah, because when you take someone out of your comfort zone, he really learns more about himself, what he can't and what he can, and what his people telling him that he did, and he didn't realize that, right? Completely. That's that's the name of the game. And and, and the thing is, uh, people are are so scared. We're all scared to, to go out of our comfort zone. And uh, but the the thing is that there, but there's no there's no growth out there. And so that's that's the idea to help. And also as, as leaders and, and managers, we you know we, we train uh, leaders how to also discover for themselves to go out of their comfort zone. But a true leader will will take his people. And, and, and push them gently out of their comfort zone and, and, and really force them to, to take that step out and, and for them to realize that they're capable of so much more. What's that comment over there? What? what uh, yeah, the, there? I mean, uh, Stephen and Caroline came to Israel. Uh, we didn't do the active uh, spy games uh, in the streets mm -hmm. of Tel Aviv and Jaffa, but I did take them to a Mossad escape room. And mm -hmm. whoa, that was tough. <laughs> and, I mean, uh, what I mean that that's a question that we really plan. But what out of what you had in your career, and in your career you were a helicopter pilot for rescue unit, and and, and you did the Iron Man. That's amazing. And you took your family to travel around the world, and uh, you had family tragedy right what what made glenn what it made glenn, glenn is made from what what fractions of what periods of your life yeah well you know it's interesting because um you know here i am at the ripe old age of 55 and i'm you know i'm, I'm i think i finally like started to figure out <laughs> um and to connect uh, the dots um but i realized that what happened to me is that i when i was when I, when I was six years old, my 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 father uh, died suddenly, and um, and, I, and there I was, left as a, as an orphan at the age of six, and 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 boom, I just shut down. And what I say is that um, you know the the Ice Man was uh, was born at that moment, and so I became the Ice Man, no feelings, cut off, you know, not allowing any vulnerability, being you know super tough. And that's how I ended up also, you know, I, I decided to, to join the Israeli Air Force and miraculously, that's a whole other story, you know, became a pilot. And I flew as the Iceman, you know, no, no emotions whatsoever. And, and, I, and I thought I had it all figured out, you know, until my 30s, I was the Iceman also you know, in the Mossad and really doing these uh, amazing things, no emotion whatsoever. Um, and I thought that that was, you know, that was, that was the thing uh, and that I, I, and I had it right, but then, Luckily, um, somebody, a woman, of course, they, they're our greatest uh, teachers, she, she helped me realize the prices that I was paying for being such a nice man and cut off from, from my uh, emotional world, cut off from vulnerability. And she basically said to me, you know what, you're, you're an emotional cripple. You're a Neanderthal. And, uh, and I realized, you know what? She was right. Because she told me you know, that she loved me and I, and I just I was like I, couldn't, I, I didn't know how to reciprocate and then I realized man you know th this ice man and this you know it's a facade it's just a bluff and that helped me you know realize uh, the prices that I, that I was paying and, and gave me motivation to actually to make a change and to connect little by little and to move out of my comfort zone which was lack of emotions uh, to actually little by little to feel and to connect. And that's a process that took me like another, I don't know, five, six years to do. And, and so if you ask like, who is Glenn? It's basically, you know, it's the, it's the Iceman who ended up uh, luckily melting 
and paradoxically, and that's the thing, and, that, and that's my uh, message to, to people out there who think, oh, you know, the Mossad and, uh, you know, and the elite units, the IDF, you've got to be, you got to be tough, and you know, and but toughness is not about you know being like a you know, a, 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 you know a, a, a a tree that stands like this, like a like a cypress uh, tree or a pine tree uh, that's like uh, rigid and tough. No, toughness and, and resilience is about being able, more like a reed that can bend over, and and somebody who is able to connect to their weaknesses and to the vulnerability and the soft side, that is what I call the paradox of weakness or the paradox of vulnerability. And that is the most powerful thing uh, in, in the world. And so that's what I teach my guys also, also in the Mossad and the elite, you know, we teach them how to, how to connect to, to, to their weaknesses, not, not to deny them, not to be disconnected from them, but to, to actually be connected. And so for me, that's, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm still, all my life, you know, since uh, I've been 30 something, I'm, I'm still, I keep moving in that direction to, to connect both sides and to be, uh, you know, somehow, you know, connected to my, to my emotions, connect to the emotional intelligence, the EQ, which is so much more important than, than IQ. And that's something I want to tell, you know, people out there. And you know, if you're, if you're choosing people for a job or as a manager, um, you know, a lot of us are tempted to go with uh, some brilliant guy, you know, some, we've got the brilliant schmucks, you know that, and like the 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 assholes in the in the company, and you know they're they're really talented, and but in the end, that's it's destructive. Much better, give me uh, a a guy with an average IQ, um, but he's a mensch. You know, a good guy with emotional intelligence, somebody who can get along with his teammates. He's going to end up going much further and take our uh, team uh, much further. So if you ask like who 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 I am, that's that that's really the the big transformation that I made. Uh, in my life, and and I try to combine those two sides, like being the the tough you know, Iron Man guy, but also you know, I ended up becoming a a clinical psychologist, and um, and that's uh, you know I became I ended up being the a, the chief of psychology in in the Mossad after spending many years in the field, and combining both of those is you know the tough and the soft. That's something that that's my uh, compass, and that's something I try to pass on to other people also to strive for that. What do we see here? Christopher is from Denmark. He lives some, some of his life in New York. The green reed which bends in the wind stronger than the mighty oak which breaks in a storm confused. There you go. Thank there you there very you much. Christopher, that's um, so true. You, would, you, would you consider this as part of what Darwin said? That not the strongest fits, but those that knows how to adjust? Yeah, I think that's that's very true because it's also about uh, you know Darwin was talking about you know flexibility and you know adaptivity and uh, and that's then that's very true. We also see it um, a lot of guys, um, especially when they get to the military, you know, at a young age, 18, 19, you know, you you're very rigid and uh, set in your ways, and, and you think you got to solve things by being strong physically, or you know, that's that's not what it's about. It's it's about being flexible. It's about being able to also bend over, but also to find, to adapt new solutions. And definitely now, I think, you know, what's going on in COVID-19, that's a great, great example. And all, everything is shut down. You know it so well. You know, here, you know, this is a great example. You've, you've, all, you've mastered this, you know, these, uh, th these, these broadcasts and, you know, just like that. You can't, you know, see people. You can't bring them over. Okay, so you're managing to actually engage with them. And that's what, you know, the people are, are managing. The, the people who are able to, to adapt now, um, they're, they're the ones who, who are going to thrive, to see this as an opportunity, uh, not just to survive, but to thrive. But remember that when we started doing exercises for groups, YPO families, at first uh, we had a mission for them and they would use their natural instincts and we understood that it's not enough. It's not enough because we need to teach them something. Uh, we need to give them some skills. The question is, is it too late to be a spy? Is it too late to acquire those skills? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. You know, Freud said that, you know, we end up, uh, we developed a certain level and um, he had all his you know, theories, the uh, psychosexual uh, development uh, theory on the age of uh, 20, that's it. You know, we're, we're stuck in our ways. And, you know, Erickson, uh, who was another uh, 
amazing uh, psychologist said, uh, no, we keep on developing until the very end, until our last breath. And I am such a firm believer of that, and I see it all the time. You know, my life is also an example of that. You know, in my, in my, in my late 30s, I, I, I went through you know, a huge transformation. We take people you know, in, their, in their 50s, 60s. People, I, I, I started running. I never ran until I was 40 years old. I started running when I was 40. And I end up doing you know, ultra marathons, running 80 miles straight, and you know, and and uh, people start running marathons in their 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, the, it's it's never it's never too late uh, to to start and to learn new things. And listen, you got to be realistic. You you can't change uh, somebody 180 degrees. Okay, that's not realistic. But 30 or 40 degrees, yes. And that 30 or 40 degrees can be the delta. So whether or not you're going to succeed or not in life or, or in business. So we definitely take people uh, and we, we teach them these, these skills and they come in, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what age. I, I, you know, we've, we've had people and they're, you know, 12, uh, 14 years old and uh, people, uh, a, a guy who had a, a grandfather who was 80 years old uh, together with his uh, bar mitzvah uh, uh, grandson, and they both uh, did uh, this uh, training, and they were both uh, amazing and learned uh, things that they, they couldn't imagine they're uh, capable of. So yeah, any that that and that's a mindset. You got you know not not to think okay, oh I'm too old, I can't uh, teach uh, old dogs new tricks. Baloney. It's never too late. Uh, again, 30, 40 degrees, not not 180 degrees. Right. Uh, we have Jessica that asked. Workshops can be done abroad. Oof, tough one. Well, yeah, you know, again, that's uh, now it's it's a tough one to <laughs> yeah to say. It seems like so far off, but you know, you know soon enough, before you know it, the skies will reopen, and uh, and uh, yes, these are things that uh, we can do it uh, either here in, in Israel or or abroad, uh, anywhere, really anywhere. All you need is just to have. Uh, um, you know, a little bit of creativity, and, <clears throat> and we have we have a lot of that, and uh, and that's also you know it's a financial uh, decision of whether that's a to you know to do it here or there. Both both can work, um, and uh, it's definitely uh, it, it's not a problem. What is important is to do it offsite. You know, not to not to do you know to to, to change the environment, to leave the office, go out, you know, and, and then and then different things. Uh, uh, can happen, but we can definitely bring it uh, uh, to the to the clients uh, abroad. It could be a, a one day workshop, could be a three day workshop, depending again on the you know we'll, we'll make it to tailor made to the to the needs and the goals of the uh, of the group and of the if it's training depending on what they want to do. Yeah, that's just your face was weird and. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so last week we heard survival expert. We're uh, listening to you, Glenn, today, and we understand more and more that it's here, it's in the mind. That's our biggest tool, but it's also our biggest obstacle. Completely. Uh, you know, again, when we do the uh, POW training, I, um, I I tell the guys. Um, about our mind, uh, how you know it can be our biggest enemy, um, and I, um, I I quote or remember the the interview that I heard with a a British uh, sailor, a woman actually who had been this is year, about ten years ago, a, a British uh, frigate uh, entered uh, into Iranian uh, territorial waters, and they were taken uh, as, uh, as 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 prisoners, and they were held captive for uh, for a couple of weeks and i'll never forget the interview with the with this british uh, sailor who uh, who talked about the experience and she was uh, describing the most the scariest moment of the entire uh, ordeal she said that she was in her uh, cell and uh, someone came in uh, and uh, didn't say a word to her didn't touch her but actually took a measuring stick and measured her body dimensions and then had a hammer and nails and planks and started actually uh, building her coffin <laughs> and she freaked out and she said that was the scariest thing she ever experienced in her entire life and nobody touched her 
and nobody said a word to her. So it just shows that was all in her mind. And so that's a good example of how our mind can be a, a terrible enemy. And another thing that we, I think the main thing that we teach, the main lesson, this is something for, for leadership and YPO, it's actually a great uh, takeaway that uh, I, I, I'm sure, I hope that some of you guys have heard of uh, the uh, Stockdale Paradox. And, and the Stockdale Paradox is something that, that we teach in leadership training. James Stockdale was the highest ranking um, officer in, uh, as a POW in Vietnam. He was there for nine years. Nine years, can you imagine, in, uh, in, in captivity? And he actually, uh, when he survived it, and they asked him, who are the guys who survived and who are the guys who didn't survive? He said, the guys who didn't survive were the ones who were too optimistic. Too and they were the guys who, who thought, and they, and they were sure that they were going to get out uh, and be released come Christmas, were definitely going to be released. And Christmas came and went and they weren't released, and they died of heartbreak. And so what he was saying is, he, he's not saying not be optimistic at all, but he's saying you got to be, uh, what he said, you got to be, the paradox is, it's sort of like cautious optimism. you got to say, okay, Houston, we've got a problem. You know, I'm in, I'm in deep shit here. This is, we've got a serious uh, issue. We've got a problem. But I am optimistic that eventually I'm going to get out of it. I don't know how. I don't know when. But we're going to get through the same thing actually with COVID-19 it's perfect because he said you know we really don't know but a leader goes in saying okay we you know we've got a serious problem here we're going to get out of it but not to say okay we're definitely going to get out of this you know we're going to resume flights and, and we're going to be out of this and then the, and our quarter you know our, 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 you know turnover is going to double itself you know within 30 days and not to be too optimistic uh, that and that's the that's that's the paradox, and and we, we learned that from from Stockdale. And something I think it's a good way, a good attitude for life. Cautious optimism goes much longer than just you know this uh, uh, optimism without any any boundaries. So Daniel from Switzerland, how are you, man? I love you. That it, <laughs> the mind is our bigger and most important tool. By the way, I can't even get so first. Oh. <laughs> what? <It's> okay. <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's so irrelevant. You know, really, uh, EQ is just so much more, so much more relevant these days. It's, uh, it's so true. You have so many guys like, you know, flunked uh, out of school, but they're just, uh, they, they're the ones who are really pushing the team uh, forward. And, um, you know, even just take that, if we connect him just to, to a guy like uh, Ellie Cohen, and, you know, you see how uh, really just his skills, his social skills to, to be able to you know, not, not you know, to in his case is to manipulate other people. He you know, because he, he read people's needs, he knew how to address people's needs and how to push their buttons, how to how to make friends and influence people. Um, you know, so that's one aspect. The other aspect of being just a, a team member, all the you know, SEAL uh, team uh, members, that's also what they, they look for that quality to be able to be a you know a good uh, teammate, much, much more important than than regular intelligence for sure. Okay. One final question, anyone? No. So, Glenn, uh, I wish us both and everyone the end of COVID-19, the end of riots in the U.S. Let's get back to normal. Let's finish that movie that we didn't ask to be part of. God willing. And um, may the force be with us. And remember, no such thing as mission impossible. Mission, well, let's call it mission is possible. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Glenn, thank you very much. Pleasure. Um, soon, yeah. working together very soon. So um, that was Glenn. Glenn Cohen um, is an amazing person. He's so deep uh, in his thought and in, he can accumulate a lot. Uh, that was Glenn. Uh, we had last week a survival expert guy. We have um, we had Glenn, a Mossad agent. And next week, guys, next week we're gonna have Nimrod. And Nimrod was the person that walked with Leo, Leo Raz, the producer of Fauda, hand to hand, and he taught the players or the actors how to act, how to use the physical. Um, uh, the physical act, you know, motions in the movie. He was stunned and he's going to tell us behind the scenes of Fauda. So it's going to be in the same hour like today, a Sunday, 9 p.m. Israel time.
2 p.m. Eastern time, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is uh, Western Coast, uh, 12 p.m. So I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned. I hope you won't forget that we don't have to look at the strength only, but also look at our weaknesses. We uh, for don't forget that we can evolve. Uh, we don't stop at the age of 40. Um, and I wish you all an amazing day, amazing evening, and we'll uh, finish with... Uh, Thank you. If you've got more questions, you can put it in the comments and I'll ask Alain to answer. Um, and if you have any more, uh, let me know. We'll put some good books about the Mossad and uh, hopefully when you come to Israel, uh, you can actually experience it and learn more about yourself. Toda, Naila Tov, good night.